Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Way to go. Way to be here. Way to be strong. Way to just keep putting the oar in the water and paddling the boat. Way to show up. Way to show up. May the Lord give you strength and bless you today with, with steadfastness, with energy, with resolve, with hope, with hope, with hope. What crazy seasons we continue to weather through, right? Yeah. Somebody said this morning that uh, they were sure glad to have an extra hour, and another person said, no, I don't want one more hour of 2020. <laughs> well, we have it, so here we go, but we're going to make it. We're going to be okay. Uh, Selma Rivas told me to tell you thank you for praying for her husband. Uh, Reuben had a heart attack earlier this week, and Selma, longtime minister of our church, called upon you to pray. And through God's grace and the skill of a wonderful medical team, Reuben is recovering well. And uh, she wanted me to tell you that, so way to go. Thanks for your prayers. And, and speaking of prayers, this is an important week for us to pray for our nation as we head into a national election. Uh, did you know we had an election coming up? Just, sorry, just kidding. Of course you did. And it's important that we vote, and uh, it's even more important that we realize that the most important vote has already been cast, and that is God's vote in favor of humanity, and that he's on the throne, and regardless of who's in the White House, the throne room is occupied, and we can trust in him. Amen. You know, it was about a year ago, in fact, it was exactly a year ago this weekend, that during the middle of a sermon that I was sharing uh, uh, on the theme of revival, uh, one of our elders stood up in the middle of one of the services and began to sing the song, Revive Us Again. Uh, the whole church stood up, and, and I took that as the Lord's desire for us to be more serious about praying for revival. A group of people began praying every Sunday afternoon at 5 p.m. for revival. That's gone on for a whole year now, uh, initially, of course, in person, more recently, virtual prayers. But it's also expanded into a citywide prayer effort uh, last summer, a couple of times at the AT&T Center in the parking lot, and then last weekend and this weekend at San Pedro Springs Park. Today we're going to gather with pastors and people from all over San Antonio and the Hill Country to pray, to pray for healing, to pray for help, to pray for protection over our city, uh, and to pray for the Lord's will to be done. Uh, you don't need to register if you'd like to come in person. In the past, we've requested registrations, but we don't need that today. If you'd like to come to San Pedro Springs Park and use this beautiful Sunday afternoon as a time of prayer, we ask only that you come and don't bring any virus with you. If you have a virus, please stay home. You need to be at home. And if you're cautious or concerned, as we all are, if you're concerned, you can participate online, online by going to PraySA.org, PraySA.org, or MaxLocato.com at 3 p.m. We're looking at probably about a 90-minute prayer service if you'd like to be a part of it. And now, Lord, we turn our hearts to you, asking for your presence, your power, your word, your strength to speak to us today. In a world in which so many people are pummeled by the pandemic, by political seesawing, by personal issues, we really need a word from you today. And we thank you that you promised to give it. Through Christ we pray. And all the church said. <clears throat> In a 1962 episode of The Twilight Zone, the story tells of a narcissistic, harsh man. He hunkers and bunkers in apartment convinced that the whole world is one big conspiracy theory. He and only he perceives the world for what it is, and that is a planet inhabited by evil people. The episode begins, as each does, with an introduction to the Twilight Zone by, does anybody remember? Rod Serling. Boy, some of you just showed your age. Rod Serling. In fact, I saw that The Twilight Zone is one of the hottest shows on television right now. He introduces the self-absorbed man this way. 
That's Oliver Kringle, a dealer in petulance and poison. And he proceeds to talk about Kringle's metamorphosis from a twisted fanatic, poisoned by the gangrene of hate, to the status of avenging angel, upright and omniscient, dedicated and fearsome. <clears throat> Kringle is a man of no empathy. He rages against people he's never met. He demands that their employees fire them. He calls upon law enforcement to arrest them. In Krangel's world, only he is good. He sees nothing but good in himself. And he ascends the judicial bench of self-righteousness and declares a guilty verdict on everyone else. He concocts a plan to purge the world of all unsavory folk. And he informs the FBI that at 4 p.m. that afternoon, the world's despicable and evil people will be easy to identify because he is going to shrink them all to the height of two feet. As the fateful hour draws near, Kringle can hardly contain his excitement. Justice will finally be served. Evildoers will be disclosed and he will be seen for the hero that he is. So, at 4 p.m., he rushes to the window to look out and to see who has been reduced to size. But alas, he's not able to look out the glass. He, Krangle, has been shrunk. He is two feet tall. You know him, Mr. Krangle. Have you ever crossed trails with a small-minded, self-centered, despicable despot who demands that everybody else subject themselves to him? They have the audacity to think that they and they alone have the world understood. Consequently, they abuse, they bully, they scorn, they enslave, they even seek to exterminate. Haman was a Kringle. The villain of Esther's story lived inside a one-person world. Everyone else was called to bow down to him. When one of them didn't, a man by the name of Mordecai, Haman declared his fate as well as the fate of his people. And that would be death. Death. Yet his swagger was short-lived. His reign of terror came to an end in the dining hall of King Xerxes. So the king and Haman went to dine with Queen Esther. And as they were drinking wine on that second day, the king again asked Queen Esther, what is your petition? It will be given to you. What is your request? Even up to half of the kingdom. This is the second banquet, feast number two. And so much has happened since feast number one. We talked about it last week. Haman plotted the death of Mordecai, the Jew. J the King Xerxes, however, chose to celebrate and honor the life of Mordecai, the Jew. The king publicly applauded the man whom Haman had sought to destroy. Haman was so angry and upset that he nearly missed the party. Just like banquet number one, the wine was abundant and food aplenty. And the festivity helped Haman forget his miserable day. He was just about to pour himself another goblet of wine when the king asked the queen what she desired. You might recall he's asked this question twice. And both times she has deferred, but now the time was right. I'm thinking that her heart rate was at triple digits when she said, if I have found favor with you, your majesty, and if it pleases you, grant me my life. <clears throat> this is my petition and spare my people. This is my request for I and my people have been sold to be destroyed, killed and annihilated. 
If we had merely been sold as male and female slaves, I would have kept quiet because no such distress would justify disturbing the king. Now, the important words are the small words in this text. The queen said, we have been sold, I and my people, to be destroyed, to be killed, if we only had been sold as slaves. We, I, my, we. Esther links her fate to the fate of her people. Remember, up until this point, Xerxes did not know that she was of Jewish heritage. And now she discloses that she is not just Esther the queen, but she is Esther the Jew. Silence certainly fell on the room like a curtain. The king's head was surely spinning, struggling to connect the dots. You're a Jew? Somebody's plotting to kill you? Somebody's plotting to kill the Jews? He asks, who is he? Where is this man who has dared to do such a thing? Here it comes, folks. Esther said, our enemy and foe is this wicked Haman. Then Haman was filled with terror before the king and the queen. Haman, all two feet of him, began to tremble. He had no recourse. Both his jaw and his goblet dropped. Xerxes stormed out of the room, livid, fuming, seething with rage. He was angry at Haman for playing him the fool, angry at himself for being one. The blood drained from Haman's face, and unless he acted quickly, it would soon drain from his body. He threw himself upon the mercy of Esther, literally. He fell onto her couch, begging her to help him. Xerxes re-entered the room and saw Haman groping in the direction of his queen, and that did it. Haman, who wanted to kill a Jew for not falling down in his presence, was caught falling down before a Jew. Oh, the ironies continued. The guards took Haman in custody. One of the officials looked out the window at the 75-foot gallows that Haman had constructed for Mordecai, and he said, well, if I may make a suggestion, your majesty. And he pointed toward the execution instrument. Xerxes gave the nod, and Haman got the point. There's much more to be resolved in the story of Esther, namely a decree to exterminate all the Jewish people in Persia. But we're going to press the pause button right now and pick that part up next week because we need to make sure we make a very important point that appears throughout Scripture, but clearly here in the book of Esther. And that is our God is a good God and the wicked will not win. The wicked will not win win. We live in a day that even says there are no wicked people. Everything's relative. Intolerance is the virtue. And nobody's really wicked. Scripture's clear. No, there are wicked people. There are wicked people. There are wicked people to tell God to leave them alone and disregard his teachings completely. And the teaching of Scripture is the wicked will not win. Nothing escapes God. I wonder if you have time for another example. Scroll back on your timeline 150 years into the nation that preceded the Persians, the Babylonian Empire. And look at the story of Belshazzar. He became king of Babylon in 539 B.C. Again, 150 years before Xerxes. In a fateful feast, he invited about a thousand of his gentry to join him in his banquet hall that was reportedly 1,650 feet wide and a mile long. Along the walls of this banquet room were pillars carved to look like elephants, some 450 of them. There was music, there was dancing, and you guessed it, there was much wine. 
While Belshazzar was drinking wine, he gave orders to bring in the gold and silver goblets that Nebuchadnezzar, his father, had taken from the temple in Jerusalem so that the king and his nobles, his wives, and his concubines might drink from them. So they brought in the gold goblets that had been taken from the temple of God in Jerusalem. And the king and his nobles, his wives and his concubines drank from them. As they drank the wine, they praised the gods of gold and silver, of bronze, iron, wood, and stone. So when Nebuchadnezzar overthrew the city of Jerusalem and he destroyed the temple, he took all the artifacts and brought them home with him. All those artifacts from the temple, every utensil, the menorah, the, the, the table of the showbread, uh, every spoon, every fork, and yes, every cup, every cup. And these utensils stayed in storage for 50 years, going untouched until this party of Belshazzar. And he called for those cups that had been used in the temple, holy utensils, to be used in a pagan celebration, a drunk wine fest. Now, why would he do this? Were they out of cups? Were they out of glasses? Did their dishwasher break? Did their kitchen staff go on strike? No, this is a targeted move on the part of Belshazzar. He wanted to blaspheme the God of Israel. He wanted to make a mockery of Jehovah. So he used these holy utensils in a drunken pagan celebration. Friends, his irreverence did not go unnoticed. Out of the sleeve of the night, a mysterious hand came into view. Suddenly, the fingers of a human hand appeared and wrote on the plaster of the wall near the lampstand in the royal palace. The king watched the hand as it wrote. His face turned pale. He was so frightened that his legs became weak and his knees were knocking. Can you envision this moment? A hand disattached from a body appeared out of thin air. It hovered in the glow of a lampstand. And a finger, the finger of the hand, began to carve a message into the plaster of the wall. Silence fell over the entire room. All thousand people, deathly silent. King Belshazzar shook so much that he fell down. And his proud sneer became a troubled frown. His boast became a whimper, and his heart pounded like a kettle drum. The people could not decipher the writing. Belshazzar called for the astrologists and the diviners to come in, interpret the message, he said, and I'll make you rich and powerful. None could. The wife of Belshazzar overheard the commotion and stepped into the banquet hall. When she saw the king, she said, don't be alarmed, don't look so pale. There is a man in your kingdom who has the spirit of the holy gods in him. Call for Daniel, and he will tell you what this writing means. Daniel's an older man now. His hair is silver, his his back is stooped. He spent his life in Babylon. But his mind and his faith are as keen as honed steel. Belshazzar offered him money and power. He dismissed them both. He reminded Belshazzar how God had humbled and disciplined his father, Nebuchadnezzar, with a season of insanity. Belshazzar, he says, should have been paying attention, but he wasn't. But you, Belshazzar, his son, have not humbled yourself. Though you knew all this, Instead, you have set yourself up against the Lord of heaven. That's the definition of wickedness. Someone who sets themselves up against the Lord of heaven. You had the goblets from his temple brought to you, and you and your nobles and your wives and your concubines drank from them. You praised the gods of silver and gold, of bronze, iron, wood, and stone, which cannot see or hear or understand. But you did not honor the God who holds you in his hand who holds in his hand your life and all your ways therefore he sent the hand that wrote the inscription this is the inscription that was written many many tekel parson this is what these words mean 
Many. God has numbered the days of your reign and brought it to an end. Tekel. You have been weighed on the scales and found wanting. Paris. Your kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and the Persians. That very night, Belshazzar, king of the Babylonians, was slain. <clears throat> and Darius the Mede took over the kingdom at the age of 62. At the, precise, at the precise moment that Daniel was speaking, the Medes and the Persians were creeping through the underground aqueducts, ready to take the city. Belshazzar never saw it coming. The takeover was swift, total. The mighty nation of Babylon collapsed. Belshazzar was killed. And we are left with yet another sobering reminder, and that is our God is a just God. Our God is a just God. Now, what are we to do with stories like these? What are we to do with stories in which an evil, anti-Semitic crangle of a man comes to an end, in which Belshazzar, irreverent, disrespectful, who had a regard for nothing as being holy, comes to an end. Where do we go with these stories? I think of two directions. Number one, for some of you, this is a, a word of caution. It's a word of caution, a reminder that God will render to each one according to his deeds. Do not think, my friend, do not think for a second that God will turn a, a blind eye to a life or acts of rebellion and deeds of malice. The scripture says, therefore, consider the goodness and severity of God. Goodness and severity. We love to consider the goodness of God, do we not? How many songs have been written about the goodness of God? How many sermons have been preached about the mercy of God? How many books have been written about the grace and wonderful grace of God? And yet, how many songs have been written? How many songs do we sing that acknowledge the day of reckoning that awaits all evil people? Not so many. Out of curiosity, I pulled a concordance down off my shelf looked up the word wrath of God, looked up the word mercy of God, and just tallied up the number of references of each just to compare. The number of references in the Bible to wrath of God, 108. The number of references in the Bible to the mercy of God, 48. It's good to talk about the goodness of God, and nobody wants to talk about the goodness of God more than your preacher today. But to discount the severity of God, the just nature of God, to present God as a teddy bear who is blind or ignorant or indulgent toward the wicked and the evildoer is simply not a fair presentation of the characteristic of our holy God. Somebody needs to hear this today. Somebody is in a cycle of sin. And somebody has been led to believe that they can continue to do what they're doing and God doesn't see and God doesn't care and that there will be no punishment and that there will be no consequence. That's the culture we live in. I do what you want and long as nobody gets hurt, friend, somebody's going to get hurt. There are consequences to our actions. God is gracious to those who trust him, but he's dead serious about correcting those who rebel against him. Today's adultery is tomorrow's divorce. Today's indulgence is tomorrow's addiction. Today's laziness is tomorrow's poverty. Most supremely, dismiss God in this life, and he'll dismiss you in the next. Spend a life telling God to leave you alone, and on the day of judgment, 
He will do just that. Actions have consequences. Has this pandemic had a negative effect on your life? Has it caused you to engage in some behavior that you know is irreverent or rebellious against God? If so, the reason God has you listening to this story is to tell you he sees. And you will not escape. Return. Return to your heavenly father. For some of you, this is a word of caution. For some of you, oddly, a bit strangely, this is a word of comfort because you have a Haman in your life. You have a Haman in your life. He was the boss who demanded servitude. She was the teacher who played favorites. He was the uncle who abused his niece, the husband who womanized his way through marriages, including yours. The pastor who was more arrogant than reverent, who used the pulpit as a way to be seen, not as a way to serve. Haman's snake their way into our worlds. And when they do, victims feel their calendars flip to January and they are left in the chill of the consequence, searching for springtime, wondering, does God know what this Haman is doing? Does God care about my suffering? Will Haman ever meet justice? Or to borrow the words of the psalmist, oh Lord, how long will you look on? Or Jeremiah who asked, why does the way of the wicked prosper? Do evildoers evil get a free pass? Do oppressors walk free? Do Hamans and Hitlers and lynch mobs and porn peddlers get away with murder? The resounding answer from Scripture is no. No. The day is coming when God will forever balance the scales of injustice. God has set a day. It is set. He has determined a day in which he will judge the world. The louse who took advantage of you, God knows. The seductress who divided your home and wrecked your marriage, God knows. The racist who raged, the misogynist who raped, the bully who bullied, God knows about them all. God is a just God. And God is angry with the wicked every day. To be clear, friends, the door of repentance is wide open right now for anybody, regardless of how wicked they are. It is not his will that anyone perish. But the fact that some will is simply a marker of his justice. Satan knows this. I didn't tell Satan anything new as he listened in to this sermon. The demons are not saying, oh, I never knew that. They've known it from the beginning because they realize that the real battle is against the devil and his forces. The scripture says, we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against the spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. The devil placed the anti-Semitic hatred in Haman the irreverence in Belshazzar. He is the Hitler behind the Hitler, the pimp behind all pimps, and the pillager behind all pillagers. But his days are numbered. And he knows it. He knows it. He's angry because his days are short. He's angry because he knows that the tables have been turned. Just as Haman died on gallows that he made for Mordecai, Satan was defeated on a cross that he designed for Christ. God raised Christ from the dead and seated him at the right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule, authority, and power, and dominion. And after he did, he made it clear God's plan was made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. Everybody in the heavenly places saw it. The devil saw it. And that is the very cross that the devil had hoped would be the end of Christ became the beginning of life for billions of people. Don't you know, every time Satan hears us celebrate the Christ, our Christ who died on the cross, he kicks himself. Had he known 
that an instrument of death would become life for us, he never would have been a part of the cross. Had Haman known that the gallows would serve to bring his own life to an end, he never would have created those gallows for Mordecai. But Satan, Haman, Belshazzar, Krangle, they don't see it coming. It's hard to see anything when you're two feet tall. Gracious Father, these stories that you gave us today, are, they're sobering. They are. But they're a reminder. They, they, they rightly adjust the lens of our eyes so that we see what's happening. Father, we pray for mercy for those who have turned from you, who have fallen into a state of wickedness, those who worship Satan, those who worship alcohol, those who, those who indulge in every type of evil behavior. We beg, O oh Heavenly Father, that you would please awaken them. Even as we pray, names come to our minds of people that we know. Have mercy, please. And have mercy upon us that we might rightly divide the word of truth and understand where you are taking civilization. Thank you. In Jesus' name.